Hello everyone, welcome here. Uh, every day we learn what, what we need to learn, what we need to know and um, why we need to understand it in order to build a better system. So basically we go through all the knowledge um, step by step and uh, I basically break it down for you into 10 different steps, 10 different areas that you need to master in order to be able to build and better systems. So number one is the C programming. It's the most common language in the world for embedded systems. Everywhere you look, everywhere, uh, every single computer that you use, somewhere down there is, is C language. Something at the bottom uh, close to hardware is coded in C and then all the other languages, all the other uh, subsystems are um, are put on top of that and um, today we have a lot of uh, tools like if you're an absolute beginner you can actually just go online and uh, and look at like REPL.IT for example where you can uh, experiment with C without having to install any compilers obviously when you start developing C programs you need to install compilers you need to install maybe an IDE uh, or if you're using Linux you just inst you already have a compiler but you still sort of there's a lot of steps involved in learning um, how to use a, an editor, how to compile programs. But uh, if, you, if you use an online IDE like, uh, like REPL.IT, you don't even need to know that. You can just go and start playing right away. Uh, you need to know, uh, understand operating systems. So uh, you learn about deferred interrupt processing. Uh, learn about uh, what it means to have a top half and bottom half in interrupts. So you have, you have a top half that responds to the, uh, to the interrupt. Uh, clears the device interrupt flags, gets gets the data, schedules uh, the bottom half, and then the bottom half runs at some other time um, when the interrupts are re-enabled. And um, uh, so, so when the interrupt executes, it, it has to run as fast as possible, and then the bottom half is scheduled for a, for a later time. So what is a tasklet? Uh, so you, in Linux, we have tasklets that uh, run in soft interrupt con context uh, when um, hardware interrupts are enabled, but it must... Uh, it, it cannot sleep, so tasklets cannot um, cannot execute some function that has to sleep, but it's guaranteed to run um, then before next timer tick. So there's different ways of uh, deferring work from an interrupt, um, and you need to understand what what is the difference between those uh, those ways of deferring work. And the reason for deferring work is because um, we want we want to complete the interrupt as quickly as possible so that uh, the hardware can send another interrupt and the system can respond to it. Uh, but we might not need to do all the work right away, uh, right after the interrupt happens. Um, and um, other ways is, for example, a work queue. You can um, uh, schedule the work to run in process context, which makes uh, adds a lot of convenience for um, for being able to. Um, to sleep in that context as well. So you can have complex functions that have to uh, do some kind of complex IO where it has to wait for another device or something like that. Learn the difference between interrupt context, process contexts, um, uh, learn why, um, why, why do you need to run interrupts in threads and why it's convenient uh, to do that. Uh, you need to learn, you need to understand how computers work, uh, you need to understand how flash work, how um, SRAM memory works, how DRAM memory works, how EEPROM works, so what's the difference between those memories, um, how to avoid uh, flashware, because if you, if you write to flash uh, many times, uh, eventually the flash chip uh, will break because it has a limited number of times you can write to it. Um, and this is specifically important when you're um, designing like uh, really small Linux systems. Um, and you don't want to have some application right into the file system because if the system is running all the time, it's powered 24 seven and something is writing to the file system all the time, logging something, um, then maybe in a, in, in a couple of months, the system will simply break because uh, you've been writing to flash all the time and wearing it down. Um, you need to um, basically understand how uh, emulators and hardware work and uh, you can learn it. You can learn how hardware works by writing an emulator for it. So a lot of the things that uh, we have in hardware is also uh, implementable in general purpose computers. So you can easily start learning at a general purpose uh, computer and just learn through simulation um, before you actually uh, do something in, in hardware. And this is especially true for like FPGAs and uh, like using Verilog to, you can, you can basically like simulate a, Ver a Verilog circuit on the computer before you put it into an actual FPGA and then use it to, in a physical circuit. Um, so um, I made a video uh, on uh, working with QMU. Uh, QMU is a good uh, good simulator to look at. You can uh, dig into existing hardware, see how it's implemented, um, and 
try to understand it from a different angle. So, so when you look at a simulator, you understand it from a different angle compared to when you look at uh, actual hardware. Um, learn how basic Linux command work, uh, because you're going to need this when you write uh, your build scripts and uh, when you try to automate everything. So when you write the make files, CMake files, um, when you work with, um, for example, automake uh, or just uh, want to automate something uh, on the system, um, you need to understand how Linux commands work. Um, and uh, when you can do everything through the command line, it's, you can literally automate everything. So it's really easy to um, uh, to, to automate things once you understand the basic commands. Uh, learn how to use uh, simulation tools like QUCS, um, LTSpice, NGSpice, XSpice. Um, XSpice is for digital circuits. You can actually extend it with C. Um, so you can uh, so you can write uh, C programs uh, that simulate digital circuits, and then you can sort of combine it all. But I, I find that XSpice has a lot of um, it, like you really do everything through text files, and it's kind of like um, it can be tedious sometimes. Um, learn how to design power uh, supplies, uh, buck boost regulators, because you're going to be doing that a lot. Uh, every single uh, circuit board has some kind of power supply, some kind of regulator, uh, usually multiple regulators, because um, you, you're going to have different power levels. Um, sometimes you need to convert uh, a higher voltage to, like, maybe you convert 24 volts to 5 volts, uh, and then you need to use buck converter uh, for doing that. And sometimes you need to uh, increase the voltage. Uh, where you go from uh, maybe 3.3 volts to 12 volts. And in that case, you need a boost converter. Um, how to lay out RF circuits, uh, because signals uh, do really weird things when uh, they are really high frequency signals. Uh, so um, in uh, RF circuits, you can actually have, um, you can actually achieve certain effect, electrical effects by just uh, arranging uh, tracks in a particular pattern. Um, and you can actually even achieve filtering uh, by simply arranging uh, copper tracks in particular patterns. So when you get into microwave signals, it gets really important uh, how the circuit board is laid, laid out. Um, and a lot of effects can actually be just uh, achieved by simply uh, placing wires in a particular pattern. So um, how to um, how to route high speed designs where you uh, would need to to ensure that all tracks are the same length uh, because signals travel, uh, signals have a propagation speed uh, through the uh, circuit board. And if they're really high frequency signals, uh, they might arrive at different times. And um, that is a problem if you have a really high speed signals that all have to be synchronized uh, with each other. Um, there's a really good example. Henrik Forsten has, uh, has built uh, and documented uh, uh, a continuous frequency radar that he's built. So that's a really cool project. Um, how to find information uh, related to specific components through manufacturer application notes. So uh, manufacturers provide a lot of application notes where you can actually find a lot of uh, valuable information related to particular components. And uh, you can often also find information that is um, uh, like general understanding of particular type of, type of circuit um, through application notes. Uh, sometimes application notes can go in great detail just explaining uh, the basics uh, of the circuit because uh, it might be necessary in order to implement uh, a circuit correctly with a particular chip that uh, comes from manufacturer. And they also provide examples. Uh, there's a, a lot of examples, particularly for processors. Uh, they're called reference designs. So, so you can get a reference design for um, almost any any processor out there, which you can then use to um, you can customize it and then uh, integrate it into your own circuit. Uh, we have. Um, you need to understand what uh, all the logic gates mean. Uh, what does a NAND gate, uh, AND gate, OR gate, uh, XOR uh, gate, uh, what, what do all these gates mean? And um, Boolean algebra also helps you to understand sort of how to, um, uh, how to simplify uh, those gate circuits. So when you make a circuit out of gates, you can actually simplify it using Boolean algebra. That's, that's the mathematics that's used to simplify logic. Um, uh, De Morgan's theorem, because uh, it's probably the most important uh, theorem for um, sort of uh, going between, uh, so, so you can kind of convert a lo like a logical expression um, into um, involving only only a sum of products. Um, and this is um, important for simplification. So, so, so that you can convert everything to, for example, NAND gates um, and then put it into, into a FP FPGA where you have only access maybe to one type of gate and then you can build all the other gates out of a, a single gate. 
uh, computer logic um, is called computational logic, and it all started with Alan Turing and uh, Kurt Gödel. Um, Kurt Gödel is known for uh, doing things like creating proof of God and uh, all kinds of things. Uh, so he has a lot of uh, cool stuff um, that he has uh, published uh, over the years. Um, you need to understand the networking protocols, uh, the IP protocol on which everything else runs, um, ICMP protocols, um, like IP protocol is used for all the communication on the internet. So like all the websites like TCP, IP, um, and then ICMP, EGMP, UDP, like all of those protocols, what do they mean and how to use them? So EGMP you would, for example, use in um, streaming uh, of TV uh, information. So when you have your TV, when you connect your TV to the internet, you um, the the router is using uh, EGMP to to deliver the the TV stream to you. Um, and the, <clears throat> it's an effective way to uh, deliver TV stream to a lot of different um, subscribers at the same time. UDP um, uh, used for uh, sending like data that you don't need to have a connection in order to send it. You just send the data. Uh, so it's a lot faster to send data over UDP. UDP is used for games uh, like online gaming. Um, where players like multiplayer games where players just send their um, input uh, and the, the, the server responds with game state uh, to the players. DNS for translating domain names, uh, SNMP for network management, DHCP, auto IP. Um, PPP is, was used before uh, for like transferring data over modem lines um, and address resolution is uh, for resolving IP addresses into um, uh, into Ethernet addresses, into MAC addresses. Um, so uh, and finally DSP, so learn the state space models because um, they help you arrange multiple dynamics equations into a single system uh, and then you can apply generic rules in order to um, uh, in order to create controllers for for a set of dynamic equations. Uh, linear algebra helps you understand state-based models. So unless you understand linear algebra first, you won't understand state-based models uh, either because they're built on linear algebra. And then you have, um, you need to understand how transfer functions work. Um, there is the continuous time domain, which is called the S domain. And there is a discrete time domain, which is called the Z domain. And they all can be converted to state-based models. Um, so all of these three things are interrelated. You need to learn, you need to understand all of them in order to be able to, um, uh, to uh, build controllers and sort of analyze uh, dynamic systems. Um, that's it. So um, if you want to learn more, you can um, go to switchbed.com for slash free, register, get access to resources. And if you um, want to do a more complex in-depth uh, course, then you can book a call with me. So you can go to swishinbetter.com forward slash book call. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next live stream.